Hey. Wow. Greatness well, has arrived. <laughs> it's, it's a lot to live up to, man. How about it? How much is A, brother? How you doing, Bum? <laughs> I'm, gr- I'm great. How you doing? Wow, man. Super, super. Really well, thanks. How about you? Good, good. I'm proud of your sobriety, brother. Seems like, like you're doing everything you're supposed to be doing, as far as I can tell. Well, <laughs> there was a time I think you could probably tell I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> there was a time we all weren't, man. That's why we're here now. Yeah, dude. Thanks so much for coming, man. Um, it's a real honor. Absolutely. So, uh, first off, I just want to ask you, what the hell are you doing in Alabama? Okay. Um, my parents uh, built a beach house here. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, that's what I'm looking at. <laughs> oh, man, you poor guy. Right. And down there, it's like there's a patio, but then there's like a, a pool on the second on the second story deck. <laughs> yeah, it's rough. Um, so uh, we were we did a uh, my wife and I traveled for I think I'd have to look. It was since November 20th. We took off and then we just got here a few days ago. So we went through the Philippines uh, Thailand, Istanbul, Croatia, Austria, Prague, Germany, um, Paris, London, Nepal, Dubai, Costa Rica. I think maybe a couple other stops in there. Oh, the, Amsterdam. Um, yeah, and then yeah. So there was a bunch of travel. We did fourteen countries in sixteen weeks or something like that. And then we stopped with. Uh, we did a Panchakarma cleanse in Nepal. Like a, like two weeks of like Ayurvedic cleanse, like massage every day, yoga every day, breath work every day, meditation every day, and then um, and then we followed up with a an uh, entheogen immersion in Costa Rica for four weeks, and then that's we got to see like coronavirus from nothing all the way until what it is now. We were traveling in a different airport, in different trains, in different cities, different countries every week, and so we left maybe it's two to three weeks before it all started. So at every, with every airport, it got worse and worse and more masks. Oh. Typically the Chinese, um, a certain percentage of, of the Chinese population wear masks, just traveling in general. That's just what their culture does. True, very true. And, and so we saw that at the airports and that's normal. That's been normal for 20 years. Uh, yeah. But as we went from one airport to the next, we saw more and more Chinese wearing masks and then more non-Chinese and then everybody wearing masks and then nobody wearing masks. There was a point when when the word was don't wear masks, it just fuels the the, the chaos and the fear. And so nobody, but I'm like, what if I have a nice sneeze? Don't you want me wearing a mask? <laughs> and like, so we wore masks and um, finally uh, our government said that if we, um, to all Americans abroad, if you want to come back to the USA, you must do so immediately. Otherwise, you run the risk of being stuck out of the country for up to 18 months. Ugh. I think 18 months was a bit. Uh, yeah, a it bit should have been much. 17 and a half. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I think it was a little bit of sensationalism just to spark light a fire under our asses to get us. And, and but it, it worked for me because I have I have parents that are older, a bit immune compromised at risk. And so yeah. while I was totally cool, like what we were going to do in Costa Rica is, is we were going to buy a camper van. I found one for like five grand. We were going to just travel beach cove to beach cove, surf town oh. to surf town for like a year. And we were cool with that because like whatever. But um, with parents being a little bit more at risk and the inability to return to our home country uh, for that long, it just, we did made the choice to come back. And so my parents happened to be at their beach house in, uh, Alabama, which Alabama, I think of like, you know, stereotypical yeah. stuff. Cause I'm ignorant to Alabama, Very but I much. Yeah. I'm like, wow. Like there's a, the woods are behind us. The beach is in front of us. There's fr- farms that will deliver produce still. It's not that bad. <laughs> <It's> not- <laughs> No? Yeah, well, for anybody listening, if you didn't see Anthony show off the view he's got right now, I pity I'll you. I'll do it again. <laughs> yeah, do it again. Shows up late. Hop on YouTube. You can check this out. Yeah, man, that's that's a hell of a view. Yeah, Alabama and, coastline. 
yeah, we're doing all right. So my wife and I bundled up and I made a tomato salad. Just, <laughs> hours, just sitting out. Marinade. Uh, got some avocados Terrific. ready. Just good fresh fruit. There's so many things I want to ask you about. Um, <clears throat> but just to give you a little bit of context, uh, Anthony Colova, you are a man of uh, many experiences. In fact, um, that little list of little <laughs> list of um, countries you just named off is probably more travel than probably 99% of at least the state I'm in, South Carolina, will ever see in their lifetime. Yeah. I'm very fortunate. Most people, um, a lot of people don't even value travel they, and, and because they never have. And if you never have, you don't know what you're missing. And, um, and then the ones that do, do I mean, who, who gets to just go for like four months and just do whatever you want to do? Like we left on one way tickets and we nice. got this, you know, one way tickets, business class only, like yeah. the lay down seats international and, and I'm in a position that I, I've put myself in a position I've grown and I've earned this position where I can, I can splurge and I can, I can take care of my wife in this way. And we can, we can do the things that we want to do in the way that we want to do them without, without much interruption. And you talk to most people, dude, and most people are living paycheck to paycheck, and, and which I, I was doing at one time in my life. I think we've all done, most of us have done that. The 99% of the people that don't travel are all of, also the 99% of people that have lived paycheck to paycheck and have also scrambled and struggled and, and, and tried to, you know, just try to make it happen. And um, I was fortunate enough to get sober at a, at a pretty young age. Um, I, I have a, 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 some sort of gift or superpower or even sometimes a curse that just drives me <laughs> drives me forward and it 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 lends itself to it lends itself to financial stability and um I, as a result i get to travel i get to go in nice hotels i get to eat nice food and and it, it, but believe me man it wasn't i mean somebody might look at me and on the outside say oh privilege and this and that and, and i won't deny privilege to some degree i mean sure you know, I, I am a 44 year old white male living in America. So like it's, there's going to be that, but there's also behind the scenes in the weeds. If we want to get granular, there's a lot of struggle. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of work that had to be done and still is done in order to maintain this. Um, but at the same time, I've done so much of the work for the right reasons that, um, that if I lost the financial aspect and I lost the ability to, to travel and to do the things that I enjoy doing, I, I would still be able to enjoy my life. And I would still, there are, I, I have enough substance there that I can, I have something to live for. And it's not yeah. because I can fly first class everywhere I go or because I can, I can, you know, manifest the things that I want in my life because I might not always be able to right now. I'm blessed. I'm fortunate. I, I've done the right things. And, and, and this is part of my goal. So this is what I've, I've created for myself. But really the goal is, is um, above, above all, well, I like this, you know what, I want to, I want to toe the line and I want to say above all else sobriety, you know, like that's what I'm supposed to say. Right. But it's not, it's, it's really not above, above all else. It's, it's being true to my spirit and um, being true to my spirit. Sobriety lends itself to that. And that's part of being true to my spirit. And so it, it, yeah, did the chicken or the egg come first? I'm pretty sure it was the egg, but um, you know, regardless, I, I live a good life and I'm blessed and I'm going to keep on doing so as long as I stay true to my spirit, I'll be okay. That's a really unique point in, in, in the sense to the degree that I know you, because um, you are a very individualistic character. You do see, see things in a very unusual way. And um one of the biggest reasons I wanted to have you on this show is because uh, myself, even being in early sobriety, I know that there are a lot of people out there going to meetings and people say to them, as long as you stay sober today, it's a good day. Yeah, sure. That's true. But I, when I look at somebody like you, um, compared, you know, compared to other people, you've got 20 something years of sobriety now, don't you? <clears throat> nice. 21. So, I mean, this stuff builds and um oh definitely I, f I just feel like there's there's people that i meet 
that have 10, 20, 15, you know, whatever years. And, and they're still saying, as long as I stay sober, it's a good day. To the, to the, they're, that's true to a degree, but there's so much more to it than that, in my, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, there, or there can be. No, I agree. A lot of, uh, a lot of people, see, here's the thing is like sobriety is, is detrimental to those of us that suffer from this affliction. Like we, we, we are, for the most part, have always been in more pain than other people. And because we lack the tools to process that pain and to deal with it, just getting to that fucking point of staying sober is difficult enough. And then maintaining it and holding on to it, it's like, maintaining like your your nba championship like how often does a team <laughs> like was two three years three years i think is like the the most right a couple of teams have done that but to, and to it's straight it's, to last place <laughs> right and it's it's that comp it's that complicated or that difficult and when we for me uh, and and i'm I, I i want i need to be clear on something that 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 there are a thousand ways up the mountain right the mountain of sobriety the mountain of life and my way definitely is not going to work for everyone. It works for me. And it, it does include the 12 steps. It does include a higher power. It does include a lot of things that, that cross over in recovery, but it's also something that I figured out for myself that works over time. And so when, when we look at the pain that we're in on an everyday level, and then we finally do arrive at a place of not just getting sober, because we can do that one day, you know, early on, dr drugs, alcohol, sure. we, we can, a heroin addict, can be sober for one day under necessity or, or deprivation, but to have any kind of length of time that is meaningful. Yes. That, that was intentional. It is difficult. And so to maintain that we, um, it, that in itself can be painful. And if we don't have the tools to process everyday life, then staying sober is, it remains, the 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 storyline of our lives it becomes the only thing that that we can focus on because of what happens if we lose it and so so many of right. us don't graduate you know when you and you hear that some meetings you'll hear like you don't graduate from aa and i i honestly think that's horseshit mm. i i think like if 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 the goal is only to stay sober what about happiness and what about creativity and what about joy and what about love and connection and what about all of those things that are hidden below active drug use or alcoholism and then only surface on the good days of being sober mm. if if i only focus on sobriety then i'm only focusing on my foundation and and we have to have the foundation we are, obviously that has to be there we have to have a foundation of sobriety a foundation of trust, a foundation of love and forgiveness and acceptance and willingness and openness and all of those things that we are taught and that we spew out ourselves. Right. But getting to the point where those things are the foundation is, is in my opinion, should be the goal. Because after 21 years of sobriety, the one thing I, I know is something that a, a gentleman named Tony G told me when I was in treatment, and he had about five years of sobriety at the time. Okay. I was in the treatment center. And when I graduated, he said, you know, once you've been sober two or three years, you come to the understanding that to drink or to drug again is a choice. Now, one, you know, one is too many and a thousand is never enough. But to get to that point of use, we have to actively decide to do it. We have to exchange our power, which, okay, we're powerless, but we do have the power of choice. The only thing we have control over in this world is the power of choice. We know that all else is illusions, right? But if we decide and we physically choose to trade our power of choice for a life of powerlessness, again, it's on us. We're not victims anymore. Once right. we process a certain amount of pain, once we've gone through the steps, once we've learned a new framework on how to live life, we have a choice of what we do with the life that's been restored to us, given to us. Do we choose to stay in a position where we view sobriety as the goal? Or do we recognize that we've reached the goal and while we still work on it and we still step ten it in order to keep our side of the street clean and we still make sure that we're doing right by the world and by ourselves, do we then explore out and start taking risks? Because I think so many people 
don't want to risk losing their sobriety. So they don't, they don't play the stock market or they don't invest in real estate or they don't start that business that they've always wanted to start or they don't take those dance lessons that they've always wanted to take or they don't ask that girl out or they don't, they don't do the things that are scary because we are taught in sobriety that if you fail at this thing, you, you go right back down to that hole. Right. Right. And so I think there's a level of fear that is perpetuated and, and rightly so because we don't want to relapse and that fear is healthy but we have to remember that fear is a path for many people who are in addiction for people who are outside of addiction fear is a tool we should only and this mm. is my thing we should only use fear to protect us or to guide us you know in the subway have a little bit of fear if there's a situation in the jungle run away from that lion when it shows up, right? Like we're going from like primal man, running away from lions and bears to, you know, for security, um, to the subway, to our desk. So, so many of us use, pa use, use fear as a path to get us where we wanna go, but really it just gets us where the fear, you know, diverts us from the things that we really need most in our lives. Life so if, if we can view fear, fear as, a, as a tool mm -hmm. that will protect us and guide us, so that we can honor it, listen to it, use it, thank it, and then release it, then we're good. But as soon as we call upon it, as soon as we harness it, as soon as we ask it into our lives, we're in trouble. And I think that's what happens too many times when we view sobriety as the goal, is we choose to live in fear, and then we don't get to practice the things that ultimately will make us a person beyond recovery. And if we can become that kind of person, the sobriety takes care of itself because at that point we've made going to meetings a habit. We've made treating people well a habit. We've made honesty a habit. We've made, you know, treating, you know, being selfish in a way that like meets our needs so that we can meet the needs of others better. Yes. Um, that becomes habit and that becomes ingrained in our brains. And it's no longer, oh, I hate going to the gym. I got to go to the gym. I hate going to meetings. I don't want to go. <laughs> We've learned to go when we don't want to. And the hard things become easy when we do them when they're hard. If we only choose the hard things when they are easy to do, they are never going to be easy to do. And that hard discipline will never really truly form. And so when we start to take these risks, we get above the platform of sobriety and we create a platform of opportunity. It's us. It's, it's our responsibility to accept the risk, walk through the fear, encourage, embrace, yes. and figure out what's next. Wow. There's a lot to unpack there. Um, yeah, I'd like to, I tend to talk a lot. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's perfect, man. Listen, I, I mean, I'll probably have to listen to this one twice <laughs> myself. Uh, the, um, there's, were you a precocious child? What was that like? <laughs> I, was, I was shy. I was a late yeah. bloomer. I was a late okay. bloomer. I was shy. I had um, an overbearing father that had thyroid cancer and his thyroid was so out of whack that his, it, his emotions were out of whack too. Plus he was younger. My parents were 20 years old when I was born. They didn't have all the tools okay. um, wired for, you know, I mean, most parents, no, nobody has all the tools, right? right. Um, but as a result, um, I was, I was sheltered. I also, um, a big part of my story is that I had a, when I was 13, my cousin Mark was premeditatedly murdered, um, mm. shot in the head, um, at age 16, he was 16, one of my best friends and wow. I was 13, but he was my cousin. And so when that happened, my parents like closed the doors. I couldn't go out. I, I my friendships were limited. Everything in my life became done from from a place of love but protection and fear and like can't let anthony out of the house and so that formed i mean if i wasn't going to be a late bloomer that sealed the deal and mm. so uh, not i never was given the um the 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 tools to form friendships i was never taught the value of of friendships i i socially i was inept i was just not and 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 i as a result i found ways to escape um early on it, it was it was through sex you know and and not that i was having tons of sex at age 13 or 14 <laughs> you know like it was a, it was a fantasy world that that made that that maybe didn't make sense but at least it 
it filled some need and there was something there because I didn't have friends. I didn't have anybody to go to. And uh, thank God the internet wasn't around back then because I wouldn't have, you know, <laughs> shit, you know, but, uh, and, and then it, then it, I found drugs and it was, that was it. It was, it was yeah. over, you know? And so uh, eventually I came out of my shell. I rebelled at a late age because I was really afraid of, of my father um, who mm. once he had his thyroid surgery, ah. totally, totally cool. And um, we went through wow. our hard times and uh, I went through therapy with my parents while I was using, got kicked out of the Coast Guard for distribution of LSD, got a DUI um, while I had a couple of beers in me, Valium, Soma, coming down off of crystal meth, having done mushrooms earlier that day. So I was plus my antidepressants. So I, I was, I was, oh, and I got smoked some weed. So like, I don't know, what is that? Seven like course meal. <laughs> right? It was like some, a bunch of stuff was happening and yeah. um, got an aggravated DUI, uh, went to mm. treatment and eventually started to figure some things out. And, and now, you know, at age 44, have feel as though I have a decent grasp on, on life. My foundation is no longer down here. Now it's, got a foundation that's that that resonates at a higher frequency well that's why i asked you about being a precocious child because the, your attention to detail and kind of analytical desire to understand things at, at the highest level is just remarkable to me um depends on the topic well <laughs> <laughs> when i was in high school i i um i was a d d minus student um except there was one class I took that I was interested in. It was entrepreneurship. Ooh. And um, I finished that, I finished that class with 104%. So it depends on the topic, you know, got a D in, in basic math, <laughs> a barely good. I don't know how I graduated, but 104 in entrepreneurship. And um, I think it's safe to say that trend has continued through the last 21 years pretty solidly. Yeah, it has. I've sold, um, four different businesses. The first, I don't like to really count bits. Of, and my first business was a hot dog cart. I sold hot dogs. <laughs> and, um, I didn't know about that one. Yeah, 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 it was little Tony's hot dogs. And I would set up outside of the, the DMV and I'd sell hot dogs to people that were waiting for like two hours at the DMV. And then I would do special events like 4th of July, Cinco de Mayo, Gay Pride, Christmas event in the city town square. And um, sold that and went on to start selling um, d uh, CDs informational okay. CDs on eBay okay. and um, Ginsu what kind guys. of topics oh it how to buy stuff wholesale and sell it on eBay <laughs> okay so you're you're going to your own market you're on entrepreneurs I was yeah I was starting to do something and I was 20 23 24 years old at that point and I had I think I was bringing an extra like seven eight hundred bucks a weekend which you know back in 2000 I mean it's not, we're not that far from 2000. It doesn't seem like it to me, but I am getting older. So the kids are like, what? That's old school. I'm like, James Brown is old school, homie. Like, um, but back then, you know, an extra at age 22, three, four, an extra 800 bucks a week, dude. That was money. You know, I created a little lifestyle for myself. Yeah. And then so I, you know, a taste of it there. Yeah. And then I built up some other companies. I, I um, got a $700 loan from my father bought some product, sold it to a wholesaler, continued to do that, sold that company for over a million dollars and yeah. um, went on to the next big thing. The one that um, I still tell this story about how I know you've been into dieting and health and nutrition and all this stuff, and which we'll get to. But I remember speaking to you on the phone when we first met and you said you were getting into a macro diet before you found a really big success. And then you noticed um, in the chat rooms how they were talking about that. Would you would you share that story? Yeah. So the um, this was a decade ago, I'm guessing, and um, I was uh, getting ready to compete in amateur bodybuilding, my first bodybuilding show, and that was uh, that was 2010. So yeah, a decade. And slightly, maybe a year or so before that, I was looking up all the different ways to lose weight. My ex-wife had left me. Well, I guess it's been longer because my like ex-wife let me left me 15 years ago. Okay. And thank God. <laughs> it's, one of, it's one of those gifts, right? One of those. Yeah, I was a puddle of piss, and like, like to look back on that is, is amazing. Um, but I um, 
uh, spent some time fixing myself from that divorce. And part of the way I fixed myself was physically because she was a uh, exercise and wellness major. Now she's gone on to be a naturopathic doctor. And, and at the time, she was always like, you got to stop eating carbs and you got to lower your fat intake and you need to, you know, and she was like preaching the stuff she learned in school, but like really with a finger wagging type of a uh, yeah. position. And the, so the I least never attractive really, way. Right? And I, I never really wanted to listen to it until she left. And I'm like, I'm gonna get sexy. And so I started working out and it started working. Um, didn't really know what I was doing nutrition wise. So I started, you know, looking up all the stuff came across this idea of macros and um, I was on the bodybuilding.com forums and people were, you know, talking about macros. And one guy would be like, Hey, can I eat a uh, protein bar, for example, while um, dieting for a bodybuilding show? And somebody would say, yeah, of course you can eat a protein bar. Of course, if it fits your macros and macros being protein, carbs, and fat, and together they make up your total calories. Um, if you eat less calories than your body needs, you lose weight how it works it's how it's always worked and there's no way around that and so yeah it doesn't you know you can and then it was like oh well can i eat a snickers bar and they're like yeah if, if it fits your macros you can eat whatever you want you just got to hit your protein carbs and fat for the day and then you'll if they're set up right you're going to eat less calories and then you're going to reach your goal so worry less about the quality of the food i mean still focus on quality but just you know, like, and understand that it's, there's no magic in tilapia or egg whites or rice cakes. <laughs> it's like you're eating less calories or you're eating higher protein and, and lower fat. So the calories work out in your favor. And, um, I saw people yet. Yeah, and then I was like, can I eat chocolate cake? And can I eat pizza? And can I eat pudding? And it's like, oh, yes. If it fits. And they got tired of typing out if it fits your macros. So they typed out I I F Y M the acronym. If it fits your macros, I I F Y M. And, uh, that became like a hip little thing at the same time do you even lift bro was circling and so it was like <laughs> IIFYM and do you even lift and um so i went on godaddy and i just bought IIFYM and IIFYM.net and i and if it fits your i bought like 30 domain names in the space because that's i've always had a uh i guess the, my my superpower is being able to see trends before they start and being able to cap capitalize or um um uh, I'm like an opportunistic type of a you know, like entrepreneur. I like see things and I go for it. Like I own yogapants.com. And nice. just because I saw it early, I negotiated the deal, took 18 months, got it. Um, I'll do something with it eventually. I don't know what, but I um, bought IFYM.com and I launched uh, something that I thought there was a great need for. The people were like, how do I figure out my macros? And they're like, well, you take your weight and then you divide and you multiply and you add and you divide and you multiply. And then you get this whole formula. I'm like, I can put that in a spreadsheet. So I did. I'm like, well, I can get somebody to put that in JavaScript. So I did. And I created the internet, the world's first ever macro calculator where are you inter are you a man or a woman? How much do you weigh? How tall are you? What's your, in how much are you in the gym or do you exercise and what are your goals gain weight lose weight hit a button here's your macros so Super simple yeah so i invented that and um now there's thousands of macro calculators most of them i've created and or they're direct ripped off rip off of the ones <laughs> that i've created and um you know, I've always, I always stay ahead of the curve. I've gone through seven or eight iterations of that calculator. So like every two years, every year or two, I would redo it and make it more accurate based on science. And because as science, uh, as people started getting results, science started looking as to why they were getting results. So new studies were coming out to either back up or disprove the macro nutrient philosophy or protocol. And then I would look at the, those scientific studies. I would look at the anecdotal success of people and the failures of people. And then I would adjust the, the calculations within the macro calculator in order to facilitate more accurate results. And so I always stayed ahead of people. And then I just eventually one day looked at Google Analytics and I was like, ah, what's this website doing? Oh, 1.5 million unique visitors per month. Um, <laughs> All right, I better I better do something. So I, <laughs> Wait a minute, this was before you sold anything on there. Oh yeah, this is just you had fucking eighteen around. million visits a year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't actually, realize it was that big. actually more because that was like in the middle of summer and in January, February, March, April, it was two, two and Double, a half, triple. 
Yeah. Right? So it could wow. be 22, 23 million. I don't know. And that was, that was five or six years ago, I guess. And so I, I monetized it. Um, I made one small change where we added, um, in order to use a calculator, you would then have to enter your email address. You'd have to opt Mm -hmm. in. And, um, it, within a day, it was at 4,000 email opt-ins per day, tweaked it out 5,000, did a little bit more 6,000, got up to about seven, 8,000 at the peak. And, um, and then once the, the trend kind of died down and other calculators came out, it topped, yeah. it stabilized at about 3,000 a day. But I also it's made so sure amazing. that we qualified them a little bit more so the 3,000 that were coming in weren't just 3,000 emails of crap. They were yeah. better, more qualified leads. And, um, and then we would help people by um, teaching them how to do macros with uh, what was, was called a macro blueprint, with a video course, with uh, group coaching. I do one-on-one coaching, but I eventually got away from that because I'm more interested in self-care. I mean, I don't mm-hmm. know if you can see my knuckles, self-care. Ah, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, I just, I like to help people. I like to, what I do is I give people the tips and the tricks in order to hack their subconscious mind, in order to directly influence their conscious behavior so that they can become or get closer at least to the person that they want to be. And so I like to do these People call it biohacking. I don't, I'm not a fan of that term, but I like to just give people techniques that they can do every day in order to rewire their brains. And that resonates with me a lot more than the fat loss does, which is why I sold the company. Beautiful. Beautiful. So to recap, though, <clears throat> you're, you're training for an event because you, you yourself are pretty accomplished in that. Uh, um. I wouldn't say accomplished, not comparatively. If, if I compare myself, like I, I only won my class in bodybuilding twice out of the nine shows that I did. And after I won, I stopped, you, you know, Compar- okay. compared, I believe me, dude, the reason I won those shows is because I took last place at the show previously. So accomplished, I, I'm not, I wasn't a great bodybuilder, but what I was was somebody who was like great at meeting, rising to my own challenge. Well, I'll, I'll just say this for the listener. In the Recovery Authors Movement Facebook private oh, group, yeah. okay. <laughs> I posted that, the other day. <laughs> insert foot into mouth. <laughs> that, pic, that, that is a pretty dope-ass picture. Uh, for the listener, this guy has this incredibly sad photo. It, you look kind of like a stick figure in that picture, the first before picture. So I, I asked everybody in the group, I said, post a picture of you before recovery and after recovery. And yours is hands down the most dramatic transformation uh, I have ever seen in all of my life. Thank you. There's also a lot of time between those pictures. I was, I don't know how I, I could have been 17, I could have been 21 in that photo. Um, I had a full head of hair. It, it was you know, <laughs> me at, in the crystal meth days. And you know, I went into treatment at 119. Hmm. And I was there. How tall are you? Um, just about six foot. 119. 119. Yeah. And uh, I got out of treatment at 140. And um, that picture, I think I was 170, 175. And um, I, I usually walk around 190, 195. And so that was a very lean, very muscular photo, like oh, yeah. pretty close to a bodybuilding show. Um, I gave that up. Um, I gave up the bodybuilding. I gave up the vanity. Um, I, you know, I've done a, a, a number of, uh, plant-based journeys, um, in recovery to further my recovery and for further my spirituality and get some answers and some clarity. Mm-hmm. And, um, I've, you know, been given a mandate by source, by God to follow a specific diet protocol, to, um, treat people a certain way. I have a set of contracts that were given to me by my higher power that I don't question. And so things have changed. Um, No longer interested. I I mean, I would love to have abs and be walking around, you know, but like (laughs) um, I haven't worked out like in six or seven months since we started traveling and selling the company, got back to Burning Man. and was like, we're going to sell this company and then we're going to, you know, do things differently. And um, I just, it's not that I gave up exercise and fitness. I love it, but I just moved in a different direction and got busy. And so I plan on getting back to it eventually. Cool. Um, I know Burning Man has always been a big thing in your life. Absolutely. Yeah. And is RVs. There is there a question? No. <laughs> I, 
<laughs> well, I because I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that for an hour, man. <laughs> I want to tie in. We we can certainly talk about that, but the recent photos I looked uh, uh, at of you with um, with an, another individual. I'd love to touch on uh, your recovery in relationship uh, with your wife. Oh, yeah. So my my wife. Wow. I I um I don't deserve her. I don't, I, I say this quite often, and that's not low self-esteem talking. That is the juxtaposition between who I was, who I am, and who she has always been. And she makes me a better person in every possible, I mean, when I coach clients, I coach them on the, the seven pillars of wellness, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, social, financial, and sexual. And I try to get people to improve in all seven of those areas or at least be aware of what they're doing in all seven areas and, and try to map out where they want to improve. And then I give them the tools to do so. I need that process, that, that framework. I need a, a, a system, a process to follow in order to stay on path. The 12 steps is a good example. That's one of my systems, right? Um, I have a bunch of other things that I do, but she was born with this ability to shine light regardless of how much darkness is coming her way. And that, that inspires me to be a better person in all seven of those areas and in, in, in areas I don't know. It's just, I feed off of her energy through osmosis. It just hits me. And um, now she is not in recovery. Um, she has fun. I would never say she's a party girl. She, we'll drink some wine for the first 10 years of our relationship, which she would ask me, is it okay if I have wine? And the answer was like, you got to stop asking. <laughs> Just have the wine. I'm not even, I'm not attracted to it. I don't, it would be nice. I'll admit, you know, it would be nice to be able to sit down and have a glass of wine with my wife and experience whatever that is that normal wine drinkers have. Sure. That yeah. Communion, that camaraderie or that fraternity, whatever that is. It would be cool because I don't have that. I gave that opportunity up when I got sober gladly, you know, but sometimes I'm like, that would be really cool. But then I'm like, well, I could drink root beer <laughs> and it doesn't really matter because I'm st still in the same social s situation. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so she, you know, she has her fun, um, but it's not like a need. It's not like a desire to escape. Like we know it's a, uh, right. It's just her being normal, you know? So I'm married to a normie and I wouldn't want it any other way. She supports my recovery beyond measure. She's, she supports my, my entrepreneurship, my business ideas. She supports my risks. She supports our travel. She supported all of my entheogen immersion in Costa Rica where, you know, I mean, if you don't know what that stuff is, you know, some old timers would say that's a relapse and, you know, and, and I, it took me three years before I decided to like even pursue ayahuasca after it was calling to me because I needed to do the work to make sure that when I finally did show up in plant medicine, that I, I had been meditating again and journaling and doing affirmations that I had done the, 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 the work because I didn't want to go into plant medicine without a clean, clean platform knowing I had done everything I can in order to connect to my higher self and to my God and my spirit and whatever else there was that I couldn't quite understand and she supported that and walked me through it walked by me walked in front of me to protect me walked behind me to push me forward and walked by my side to hold space she she's everything there's a there's a lot of listeners that won't have uh, <clears throat> a clear picture of what that looks like the ayahuasca stuff uh, can, can you I can go I can go into it if you like and I can approach it with a recovery attitude and well, so that would you it, please I yeah because I really think that would be a valuable component here okay <laughs> so let me let me say that I I don't think anybody who is new to recovery has any business messing with this stuff <laughs> let Good me point. just prep it took me 21 Hear years this of clear. sobriety yeah. right 21 years of sobriety before I did it it called to me in 2017 and um I was asked to be part of a um documentary that was going to be done and then the, the funding fell through the, uh, the the gentleman who is going to do it both of his parents died two weeks apart from one another in totally unrelated unfortunate situations and so um 
it just didn't happen but the, the seed was planted and uh, for those that don't know, ayahuasca is a plant. It's a combination of a, a vine and, a, and another plant that are merged together. One is an MAOI and one is um, a DMT derivative. Um, the, when combined, the body ingests the, it, 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 the way that it, it manifests is, I, I'm not, I can't say similar to to psilocybin mushrooms, I can't say or similar to LSD or you know mescaline and peyote or San Pedro. It's not like any of those. You cannot party on this on this substance. This is not something you do to escape yourself. This is something you do to go further into another dimension, further into the spirit world, further deeper into your soul, to understand more about you, more about your higher power, more about your your behaviors, your character defects, um, and more to communicate through the spirit world. And um, it, it is said that one session of ayahuasca can be the equivalent of two years of um, cognitive therapy with a counselor or psychiatrist, therapist. And I, I would agree with that. And um, it is similar to psychedelics in that there will be visual experience of sacred geometry coming in through your mind and, and my interpretation is that's god's fingerprint that's god's computer code downloading certain things changing us we when you do these things the physiological effect is that the brain produces more neurons more neuron synapses more neurotransmitters it starts producing new neurotransmitters which they thought was impossible but happens and um, as a result, these new neurotransmitters are actually stronger than the current ones, and they find new pathways in the brain. And, um, you know, like the, the phrase, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And we all know how old people are kind of set in their ways. The older we get, the farther we get from imagination, and the closer we get to, like, this is how things are. <laughs> well, that's because the, our neurons and the neuron synapses, are, the neurotransmitters are firing in a specific way. And eventually, that electrical signal follows a path in our brain. And it becomes, it becomes efficient. It follows the path of least resistance. And it's like, we've always fired this way. So it, what it does is it creates this little electrical pulse that kind of kills the area around it. So the electricity just follows that path. And um, it becomes easy and you become stagnant. It's detrimental, and, yeah. Right, and we don't, we don't grow anymore. And so when you create these new pathways through these, these entheogens, I don't, they're not referred to as psychedelics because the psychedelic could... There, there's three different areas of like LSD that you can go into, right? Um, with ayahuasca or Bufo, 5-MeO-DMT specifically, there is very limited. You're going into something in order to commune with the spirit world. And the physiological scientific effect on your body is that these neurons are formed and you start having new um, pathways like followed. And then, so when you come out of it, there's this new behavior that is just there. It's this, it's, you have, you go through an understanding of what you've been doing wrong or, or what you could be doing right, or some new understanding of God or nature or your ancestors or, you know, other dimensions and your relationship to the world and energy and God as it is in this reality and this possibility. And then you're shown these things. Everybody is shown differently, but like, this is a pretty common experience. So you see these things and then when you come out of it, you have the benefit of like new neurons that are firing in different ways that lend themselves to not doing the old things, but doing the new things. And um, it's well an said. absolute amazing way to transform yourself if, you, if your intention is to, to grow towards God, to grow towards peace, to grow towards love, to grow towards the best highest version of yourself and resonate at a level that allows for change if if there was a, a gentleman um in my thing a really awesome dude and his first his first night was a struggle he he had some pain and he had some demons and he had some things he had not mm. yet addressed so his first journey in ayahuasca was four or five hours of violent purging vomiting wow and um like wow. it, was, it was pretty, it was, it was rough. And, and I yeah. admired the shit out of him for going through that. And even more so for, admired him for going in to round two, two nights later. And then round, <laughs> and then round three, 
two wow. nights after that. And the transformation he made, I, I talked to him a couple nights ago. We're going we're gonna to stay in touch. Absolutely amazing. Now, I'm not saying like this is what people should do in order to facilitate their recovery. I did it. I, I had to look as like, is this done in recovery? Because right. I can't jeopardize my sobriety. I can't, I can't risk, even if it doesn't throw me on a bender, I can't risk going through the shame and the guilt of like, holy shit, I just relapsed. Yeah. Right? Changing my dates, I don't give a fuck. I'm still the same person, but I just didn't want to experience that guilt and shame after 21 years of being you know, sober. And mm -hmm. so as I talked to people that were in recovery and I talked to people that do this to facilitate recovery, it was it quickly, it, it, my fears dissipated. There's still a healthy, healthy level of fear, but it, it, it was more, it, it wasn't based around um, uh, relapse. Relapse, right. It was, it was based around the unknown, going into something unknown, not like what's it gonna do to re my sobriety? It was like, well, I just don't know what's going to happen. So there, I think that, that caution needs to be there. <laughs> you sure. Know? Um, but, um, yeah, but you so did go in with the expectation that it was going to enhance your sobriety. That was your mindset. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, but I, what I got out of it was physical healing, sexual mm. healing, emotional healing, repaired the relationship with my mother, saw my conception, oh. went back in the womb, back to the cells, saw my conception, saw my mother's abuse, saw my father's abuse, generational abuse that, was, that I've inherited through my DNA and through behaviors of my parents washed away like i healed my body with my hands divine masculine and divine feminine going through my body my the masculine going like this over my body and the feminine going like this the feminine the divine feminine like bringing in love welcoming all angels all entities of love all servants of love you know christ consciousness christ frequencies muhammad buddha shiva like all of these, you know, all of the, the, the servants of, of, of love, you know, God bringing in the servants of love like this in the feminine, the masculine, pulling out the pain, pulling out the trauma, pulling out the disease, pulling out the wretched perversion, grotesque dysfunction of my life in the way that it affected me in the way that it mine affected others, pulling that out as she brought in the love. And together, the, replacing everything, all of the contracts that I inherited about who I was, who I was supposed to be, how this world operates, how, how people are, who God is, all of those contracts that I agreed to or inherited were removed and replaced with God's love. And I was given a mandate. I was given a mandate. I signed a new contract in, this, in my very first session to love above all else to love. And so now that's all I have to do is just coming on this podcast is a form of love. Doing the dishes after dinner is a form of love. I mean, all I have to do is love. And if I do that, I am shining such a bright light on my path that the light behind me that I choose to turn my back on the sh shadow that I cast in front of me, which normally dims my path mm -hmm. isn't there because I choose to shine so bright that my light lights my own path so that I can walk clearly towards that love and lighten the path of others while I'm doing it. And that's the greatest that's, gift, man. Yeah. That's like it's, 1% of like the experience. I mean, Holy shit. It was, did I, you I get to, Oh, go ahead, please. No, I was going to ask, did you get these tattoos after? Let me see these again, man. These are, uh, no, these I, are so the first one is Mr. You see Mr. Okay. That's my wedding band. Ah, nice. I got that when I got married. My wife has misses. And um, and then I got self-care. My friends bust my balls. They're like, self-care. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I just didn't want to put an R over the mister. And then I got the stars and the dots. And then I'm going to get the bufo frog right here with a, a shadow. And then bufo, the frog, the toad is going to be um, all light. And then the shadow around it is going to be psychedelic and in nature. Um, bufo is uh, a secretion that comes from the Colorado River toad and um, the, the, the crystallized vapor from that venom um, when ingested, um, unlike ayahuasca, it, there's only one thing that, that you can do with Bufo and that's become God. And I, as so I, I know this might be, this is way fucking deeper than like, I, you know, 
maybe normally we would go on this podcast, but the idea briefly is that as I ingested it, I became one with all existence. I became, I left my ego, left my body. There was no Anthony. I basically um, died. I, I, I understand what happens to the human body when we die. I, my spirit exited my body and returned to God return to source as I united with everything outside of time and space. And I existed as pure existence and nothing else as my entire being shined light at the resonant frequency of God's love and divinity. Um, I realized that I am all there is. God is all there is. I am everything. I am nothing. And we are all exactly the same. And it wasn't like somebody told me that it wasn't like, like I sat down at the river of source and meditated with God. It was, I embodied God's love. It's just as known. God. Like yeah. it was no choice, no choice. Like this is what that stuff does it. And then coming out of it, it was like, well, I I'm, I'm ready to die. Like, I don't right. want to die. I got shit to do in this world. I've got people to help. I've got a life to live. Yeah. But I'm really looking forward to returning to source because of how powerful that experience was. And now I, I understand that when we talk about Christ and we talk about uh, Muhammad and we talk about religion and we talk, you know, like this is man trying to understand God by limiting God and putting God in a box. You know, religion is like defining God. And it's like, uh, I no, that's that's for people faith is for people who believe that there's a god i no longer believe in god i i am god i understand that that god is in control of this vessel that this experience is god's experience and that th there is nothing else there doesn't need to be anything else all of the bullshit went away and i saw myself connected to every living thing on the planet and every not the water the mountains the sky the stars the moon the universe every possibility just pure existence and so i know what god is and that might sound grandiose it might sound egotistical or but after going through this experience being shown what i was shown it's it is the most powerful love that there is and nothing else matters. And so if, if I can in some way help others to just by, by expressing love and being love and you know, whether that's through forgiveness or acceptance or um, adding hope or strength or, or giving somebody some money or some food or just leading by example in some way, I'm going to do it. I have to do it because love is all there is. And that is the power of some of these things that I went through. And if that, my friend, doesn't help my sobriety, then we're, we're, we're talking about two different kinds of being sober. There's echoes in what you're talking about here. When I think about some of the LSD experiences I had in my teens, yeah. sure. uh, I suspect it wasn't to the degree, but, but the, the central scene that God is love and I am love and that's all that matters. That's always resonated so much for me, man. It's really yeah. cool to hear that you've had these experiences and you are glowing, by the way, when you came on. <laughs> Cause you just got back from experience, right? This was the, this about, was the one you talked about in Costa Rica. Yeah. On, it's been uh, about Facebook. a week or 10 days. Yeah. My God, um, uh, explanation. Yeah, that's probably, I can that's post that. I can post it in your in your group. I, I, I what I don't want to do is I don't want to trigger people, you know, because I don't. I, the, the the problem with this is like somebody can hear all this and it sounds great and it sounds like a shortcut, but what they don't realize is like this was my experience because I did the fucking work and a lot of people that don't do the work go through hell. I went yeah. to heaven. A lot of people, because that stuff has to come out in order for you to get to this point. So if you don't do the work ahead of time, you're not going to have a similar experience to what I had. You're going to have a similar experience to my friend that was just like a purging cocaine a addiction. Trip. 
Yeah. Oh, it, 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 well, see, a bad trip is, is resistance. A bad trip is nothing but resistance. And that's when then paranoia and fear come in because we don't want to look at the things that are being shown to us. And we're trying to hold on to our ego. And we don't want to look at the fact that maybe we're in the wrong relationship or maybe that we had some abuse happen or we, there's some fear there and then we don't want to look at it. So that resistance fuels the, the bad trip. Whereas, you know, you can get out of a bad trip just by surrendering. Sure. Uh, this stuff, there's no surrender. It's just, here you go. And whatever is in there is going to come out. And what was in me was 21 years of work that lent itself to an experience as magnificent as the one that I just described. Whereas if you haven't done these things, if you're a year sober, you might have it, you know, but you're running a risk. And I think if you don't do the work first, you don't really have any business you know, jumping into this stuff, which is why I'm like hesitant to post that in the group, because on the one hand, it could very well lend itself to somebody making a sober connection to their God, you know, through meditation, sure. through journaling or whatever. And then on the other hand, it very well could be, you know, um, an ex uh, uh, another pathway for them to escape themselves and their pain, which this stuff should not be used for that and people who are new in recovery i know i was like this are still looking to, <laughs> like if, if i was it was told uh, if you could if you could take it if we could create a pill that would like make you sober you know we would abuse that pill <laughs> take what will two of them do <laughs> we take two of them right like and that that's the thing and so I, I'm, I'm hesitant to like I, I was hesitant to even talk about the bufo because that shit is so far out there that yeah. people might be like viewing the first 30 minutes of like man this guy's got his shit together and then i'm like and then rain <laughs> out of my ass i'm <laughs> licking frogs <laughs> yeah well don't lick the frog it'll kill you you have to you have to, you have to vaporize it but nice. yeah, and it's, so when people are ready, but um, what I'll do is I will, um, with your permission, after you sit on it and think about whether or not it will truly add value to your group, um, yeah. I can go ahead and I can post it up in there. And, and oh, I can make myself available to answer questions because I, I recognize that people will have questions and that not everybody in recovery is going to resonate with this. And there's some people I'm sure that are already watching this, like, oh, he's just doing drugs. He just relapsed. He just went to yeah. Costa Rica and got blitzed out of his brain. Those people exist. And I, and, and, uh, I can't do anything about them. But I also don't – it doesn't really matter what they think about me because I know where I'm at. I know where I'm going, and I know what my purpose is. And so um, – if it adds value, I'd love to. Well, I, I do want to be respectful of your time and, and I'm glad you just said what you did because there's one more thing I'd love to uh, get your take on. And that sure. has to do with, um, <sighs> respectfully, what your, um, so it, it feels to me very much like there's, uh, and, and, and even going back to 2017, there thereabouts when all these um, things got to be a big deal. With, um, with the uh, psychedelic experiences and whatnot, but the, um, the emergence of people who are willing to expose themselves and cast anonymity to the, uh, to the rocks below. And, um, you know, with all these memoirs that have been coming out about uh, recovery, it's just, there's this, it seems to be this gap between old thinking and uh, how, frankly, how the world has changed and what people are doing in recovery. So can you speak to that a little bit just in terms of what, yeah. Do you think it's healthy? Do you think it's, I think I, I it is what it is, man. Um, people, I, I don't, I don't resonate with the, 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 um, the writing style of the big book. I appreciate it. It's poetic, but it's also a dinosaur. And that's why Russell Brandt is so popular with his, take on the 12 steps you know he takes to a fucking extreme level <laughs> right but like he's he's going where it would be, end up in 20 years anyway right there could there might be a middle ground between the big book and the, you know and and russell brandt where it's maybe they don't swear you know right. maybe it's you know maybe it's like a new version where it's a little bit more palatable or sugar-coated um but in today's language so i i, I do think that that if, as long as we cling to the to the big book as being the only way that uh, we're, we're, we're running the risk of like I, um, ostracizing and excluding those people who might not, dude, you ever hung out with fucking meth heads? They don't have the best education sometimes. Some people can't fucking write well. They can't read well. I mean, not everybody, but like 
not everybody has a great education and not everybody even made it mentally out of the fourth or fifth grade. So if you try to get them to change a 400 page book life what's that <laughs> here's a 400 page book get to work that, that's written that was written in a in a in a version of english that is hard to grasp automaton yeah. are you kidding me automaton <laughs> auto automaton you know how many times oh, I've heard so automaton? many words <laughs> the, the fact that people say automaton and that we don't use the word automaton to describe you know robotic behavior of human beings like indicates that that it's a dinosaur and I think it needs to stay. I think it needs to stay because it's poetic and it's the original and it helps a lot of people and it, and it helps people grow and, and get outside of themselves and get away from maybe the street terms and get away from what they thought they knew about themselves and to focus on really trying to heal in a totally unfamiliar way. But I also think we need to have a connection to the Russell Brand type of thing where it's like, look, man, you, you don't have to read like, you know, this language that's so abstract in these, these days, it, like there's another way of doing it. There's also other programs. I think there's an app called one year, no beer. And that's mm. helping a shit ton of people. And you get all the old timers is like, they say, people will say, Oh yeah. Like there's a lot of ways, but then really it's like, Nope, this is the only way. Yeah. What I encourage people to do is like, like do it, do it this way and do it that way. And like, don't just pick one and go with it. Like do it all, do it all, do the meditation, do the journaling, do the workbooks, you know, do, you know, work the traditions, work the steps, you know, work the meditations, do, you know, like do all of the things that you can, so that you can get a, a well-rounded understanding of, of what resonates with you the most and what is most efficient in helping your sobriety. Because one person might thrive on the big book and one person might thrive on Russell Brand's book. And who am I to say either one is right or wrong? I say, as somebody who is, you know, the phrase that when the, when the um, student is ready, the master will not, um, when the student, if the student is not ready, the, the teacher cannot say anything right. Mm -hmm. But if the student is ready, the teacher cannot say anything wrong. Ooh. Like when we're ready, we, we're gonna do the work. And if you have three or four different opportunities go like do them all and then go with the one that makes the most sense for your brain yeah. right so that way you can get the most out of it and give yourself the best fighting chance as opposed to saying the big book is the only way like i think everybody should do the steps yeah you know, does that mean that the steps are the right way they're a right way and i think we should all do them but i think that there's tons of different ways that we can look at things and you know climb that mountain on our own path um yeah. and as long as we're moving forward in love, in alignment with our spirit, with purpose, with the intention of staying sober and helping ourselves and then helping others, I don't think there's any way that we can do it wrong. That's beautiful, man. In closing, you, you said you're helping people now uh, in a new way. Um, is there anything that you'd like to share in terms of how people can get in touch with you or talk to you about these new conversations? Yeah. So I've, I've, I've taken a, a step back from coaching because I, you know, I was traveling the world. Right. I'm, I'm you know, uh, in, <laughs> doing all You're drinking root beer, right? <laughs> Ch changing the world and um, is a, is a big part of what I want to do. But after coming back from this experience, I needed to just give myself a break. And so what, I, what I've done is I've created a, um, a Facebook group. It's uh, Self Care Saturday. Um, I wanted it to be Self Care Secrets, but the girls that own Self Care Secrets, they're not even using it. But we had some technical glitches and they couldn't figure out how to change the name of the group. So it's Self Care Saturday. I like Saturdays. And, yeah, and, yeah and people are there. Uh, there's 700 people in the group. It's not huge, but there's enough. And every once in a while, I'll be like, hey, do this for today and do that for today, knowing that I'm, I've been traveling. I'm still traveling. I'm still figuring things out. We're in coronavirus world. Everything is a little bit weird right now. So if anybody wants to get in touch with me, go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash self care Saturday, or just do a search for self care Saturday. It'll come up, ask to join. Everybody gets in. And then I'll, um, you know, as I get more and more ready and more comfortable with getting back into coaching, I'll launch a program and I'll do all that good stuff. 
Man, Anthony, everything everything that I've seen you touch has turned to gold. So uh, I'm sure this is going to be a great help for people, man. Um, again, it's such an honor just to be in the presence of you, man. Your mind is an amazing thing. Uh, I really love hearing you talk. Um, it's yeah, and your your sobriety is a real inspiration to me as well. So well, thank you. It's it's it's, it's a it's an honor to watch your journey. You know, we've known each other for a couple of years now, and when we met, you were a different person. And it's it's nice to to see you go through um, the the changes that you have been going through, and see you help people in the way that you are now. This is this is brilliant. You're super active, and you're helping people through quarantine and through recovery. And it's it's a, it's a pleasure and a and a privilege to to watch to watch you do this. Thanks, man. It, it feels really good. Um, yeah, life's never been this good, and it keeps getting better. So keep doing it. <laughs> awesome. All right, man. Thanks again. Enjoy enjoy the uh, beach out there. Absolutely. Love you, brother. Take care. Be well. Thank you for the opportunity. My pleasure. All my pleasure. Thank you, Anthony. All right. Take care. Take care.